ourselves together and worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. We appreciate all that's been done thus far. And so now we'll begin with the preaching of the Word of God. In Hebrews chapter 3, I want us to go back to verse 7 just for refreshment and look at what we read last week and go down through uh, about verse 15 this morning. So Hebrews chapter 3 verse 7, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, Today, if you hear His voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation and the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me and proved me and saw my works forty years, wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. Verse 11, so I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. That was our text last Sunday morning. So here's our text for today. Verse 12, take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily. While it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it's said today, if you hear His voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. For some, when they heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not. So we see they could not enter in because of unbelief. This morning I want to look in verses 12, 13, 14, and 15 and still carry on this same truth, this danger of unbelief. It's a very deadly, dangerous thing To live with unbelief in your heart and in your life. This is the second warning passage of the five warning passages that we find in the book of Hebrews. The first was in Hebrews 2 verses 1 through 4 about not neglecting salvation. This warning is about the danger of hardening your heart or the danger of departing from the living God. And let me just say that this warning passage is the longest of all the warnings. It begins in verse 7 and it concludes in chapter 4 and verse 13. Very long. It almost takes two whole chapters to deal with this issue of unbelief. And so what I want us to be reminded of as we're working our way through Hebrews 3 verses 7 through 19, just for real quickly, in verses 7 and verse number 8a, we see the serious admonition. Look back in verse 7 in the first part of verse 8 real quickly. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if you will hear His voice. That's important. Today, will you hear the voice of God? If you, you see that? If you will hear His voice. Don't harden your heart. That's verse 8. That's the serious admonition. The scriptural analogy that we looked at last week is in verse number 8 as well. It says, as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, saw my works forty years, wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err in their heart and they have not known my ways. In verse 11 is the conclusion of that analogy. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. So he takes what happened in the wilderness wanderings of Israel 
And he brings it down to where we live today that it's possible what they did is possible for us to do today. And this brings down to this spiritual application. This is the main thrust that we want to get to to conclude the outline we started last week. What does this mean for us? And this is what it is. Just because God brought you out of a bad place in life doesn't guarantee you're saved. Did He not take Israel out of Egypt, but did all of Israel get saved? No. He changed their circumstances. He got them out of a crisis, but they never entered in. Why? They didn't believe Him. For 40 years... He manifested Himself. He magnified His power. He worked miracles. He provided for them. He promised them over and over again. Canaan was theirs. All they had to do was to walk in and get it. So this Canaan's land, this rest, that is a picture of the Old Testament, what it, it's a picture of the finished work of Christ on the cross. It's been completed. Salvation's been paid in full. You just must believe and walk with Jesus. He's going to take care of it all. But they didn't believe that. They didn't believe that. Now you hear a lot of people, well, I know I'm saved because God done this, 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 and this in my life. He done this for all. He, he, he's, listen, God's been good to everybody in this world. And if we're gauging on whether I'm saved or not just because my life got a little better, and I really hadn't changed, I can't say I'm saved. That's not salvation. This is where he's getting at is that having this evil heart of unbelief. And what you'll find that unbelief is the root issue of all our sin. If you really believe something, you're going to obey that, right? Mm -hmm. If you really think it's true, you'll do something about it, right? We do that all the time. But when it gets down to it, these Israelites, they wanted what God would do for them, but they really just didn't believe God was capable to do what was impossible in their life. And we've got to be careful about that. And so he gets to the issue down here in verse number 12 now. He gets to the issue about taking heed. Take heed. <laughs> Brethren, now let me just say something. Chapter 3 started off with him talking to holy brethren. He leaves the holy off in verse 12, meaning he's talking to a mixed crowd. He's not only talking to saved people, but he's talking to unsaved Hebrews as well. We've got to make that distinction. Otherwise, he would have called them holy brethren again in verse 12. And then he says, take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. He gives us this exhortation now here in verse 12 that's going to help prevent unbelief. And when he, he uses an illustration, verses 7 through 11, that we just addressed... Now he gives us instruction. What is the first thing that he says that's going to help make sure we don't have a heart of unbelief? He starts giving us instructions. What is it? Take heed. That first thing he said, you need to hear and heed the message. Take heed. Take action. The word take heed is a verb. It's imperative, meaning it is a command, not a suggestion. And it's in the present tense, and it means right now. Right now, where you are in your life right now, you need to take inventory. You need to self-examine and self-evaluate your life this very moment because he says, if any of you, I can't take for granted that all of you are saved. And so it says, if take heed, lest any of you. So there's the possibility... Just because you come to church and sit on a pew, we can't make that as an automatic guarantee. You don't have a heart of unbelief. 
I can't take for granted that I don't have an evil heart of unbelief. So I have to examine myself even as a preacher of the gospel. I'm not going to heaven because I'm a preacher. I'm going to heaven because I've been born again. I've done enough examining and I keep on examining that to make sure I don't have this evil heart of unbelief. It'd be foolish to say, well, one time in my life I walked out, said a prayer, and that's all there is, and that's all I've got. I can't really have any kind of assurance that I'm saved if that's all I've got. But yet so many people use that as a scapegoat. Well, we got them to make profession of faith, we got them baptized, and now they're okay. No, not necessarily. What about their life? Are they believing in Jesus? Are they trusting in Jesus? Do they love Jesus? Are they being salt and light in this world? Has there been a transformation in their life? These are valid questions that we have to put ourselves... We don't like this because we like to be complacent and think, I'm okay, you're okay, and we're all going to be all right. That's not the case. If anybody had any reason to take Great confidence that they were okay. It was Israel. But even God's warning us all of them wasn't okay. So we need to really take heed to this. So what does it mean here to take heed? My Bible dictionary defines it as to be alert and stay alert. It means to be on the lookout and stay on the lookout. It means to watch and keep on watching. It means I I never get done taking heed. Because as the wilderness wanderings, as we said last week, was Israel's test before they went into Canaan, this life that God has given us now is our test. Are we passing the test? Oh yes. That's important for us to get a hold of. So take heed constantly. Let let me just put it this way. You are to be your own worst critic. Can you take criticism and you are to be the number one giving it to yourself? I don't know about you, and I just believe this Bible. So when I read the Bible and it says, this is what it means to be a Christian, you know what I do? I don't go say, oh yeah, I've done that. No, I examine myself. I, I put myself up with the Scripture and say, if my life, and this calls you to be open and honest, The book says this, does it match my profession? Because this Bible tells us there's many that profess Christ that don't know Christ. There's many that profess Jesus but does not possess Jesus. I mean, you go out in the community today and ask everybody you meet, are they a Christian? And 99.9% is going to say yeah because they live in the south and there's a church on every corner. I mean, you listen to some of the rednecks around here, which I am one, and if they listen to country music, every country music singer's got something about God in it, though they just left the honky-tonk all night long on Saturday night, and they're in church Sunday morning singing in the choir. And they think that makes him a Christian. No, sir. So we need to take heed to ourselves. The application... In the context of taking heed, the rest of the verse tells us, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. The great danger is that there are professing Christians in this Hebrew assembly that are really not saved and they're in danger of walking away from God. And let me just say this while I'm right here. You can sit on a church pew and be away from God. You can preach in a pulpit and be away from God. You can sing in the choir and sing special music. You can be actively involved in a church and not be right with God. (coughs) Period. Paragraph. That's the elder brother's problem. Can you rejoice when sinners come to faith in Christ and everybody gets happy for them though they just left a lifestyle of hormone and drug addiction and alcoholic abuse and 
They've left this wicked lifestyle and now they've embraced Christ and everybody's so happy for them and you're sitting over there, bless God, I served God at this church for 25 years and ain't never nobody come by and shook my hand and said congratulations, thank you for your service. You're an elder brother. You're self-righteous. And the whole moral of the Luke 15 is that this old wretched, wicked, vile sinner who had just squandered his inheritance has come back to the Father and now he's in a better position because he's saved and that elder brother's not. The whole point of Luke 15 is to show that these Pharisees and legalists of Jesus, they were not right with God, though they were strict, though they fasted, though they tithed, though they went to the temple, though they taught in the temple, they were lost. Well, that's serious business. I mean, even one of Jesus' own disciples, Judas Iscariot, walked with Jesus, followed Jesus, sat under Jesus preaching, and he was lost. That's a possibility. Just because you come to an independent, fundamental, Bible-believing Baptist church don't mean you're saved. What have you done with Jesus? Do you believe? So it's take heed. Now, Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. How's your heart this morning? Some of you have been to the heart doctor. You've had to wear... Devices to track your heartbeat. Some of you have had heart casts. Some of you have had all these other tests on your heart. How is your spiritual heartbeat this morning? Jesus would say to the church at Sardis, you've got a name, you've got a reputation that you're alive, but I say you're dead. You don't have a heartbeat. You're dead, organized, orthodox, dead religion that does not have the life of God in them. Everybody thinks you're okay, but I know you're not okay. The idea is that you and I need to quit looking to other people and measuring ourselves among ourselves because Paul says that is not wise. Jesus and the Scriptures is our gauge to whether or not we are saved or whether we are not saved. If you base your salvation on the person sitting next to you on the pew, you may leave here patting yourself on the back saying, I'm doing so much a better job than them. But if you have that mentality, chances are you don't know God. Because if you know God, you have the Holy Ghost and He's constantly putting His finger on something in my life. He's constantly humbling me. He's constantly reminding me how wretched and vile and wicked I am. And at the end of my best day in life, I have to say, oh Jesus, how I need thee. So take heed. Lest any of you have this evil heart. That's why I quoted Proverbs 4.23. How's your heart this morning? And when I talk about your heart, I'm not talking about a physical door. I'm talking about who you really are. It's the innermost being of man. It, the heart is connected to the soul of man. It is the person that's going to live forever. Say one thing about it. You can fix the body and make it look to be okay. But if I hang around you and you hang around me long enough, you'll find out that we all got heart problems. Because out of the heart, out of the mouth, Jesus said, that's what defiles man, what comes out. Because you can't hide what's in here. What's in here is going to show. You let the pressure get turned on in life, and you're normally calm and cool and collective, and you can contain yourself. But you let things start going haywire, and there's a side of you really nobody really ever sees because you keep him caged. See, Jesus knows all that. And you're not fooling anybody. The idea is stop playing games with God. Quit playing church. Quit playing religion. And if you hear His voice, do not harden His heart. If He's calling you, if He's speaking to you, quit worrying about what people think. You better come to Jesus while He's calling because He's not always going to be calling. Genesis 6.3 and Isaiah 55.6. 
Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. So this causes me to ask myself a question. Does my actions, my attitudes, my desires, my, my affections, do they line up with what the Scriptures say I should act, love, do? Is it in line with Scripture? Oh me. We say, I don't like to talk about that. Well, we need to talk about it. What's the whole moral of this? If you struggle with sin, and it bothers you to sin, you have every reason to be thankful. It's this outfit that think they don't sin, that think they're doing pretty good. That's the people I worry about. Because they don't know anything about the holiness of God. They don't know anything about the justice and the judgment of Almighty. You know that just for breaking one law, God has every right to strike us dead. But look how gracious, long-suffering, patient He's been toward us. So the emphasis, you need to take heed and examine yourself to make sure you don't have this evil heart of unbelief. And this is why Paul would admonish the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians 13, 5. He says, examine yourselves. He says, whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves. Know ye not that Jesus Christ is in you except you be reprobates. So he says you need to examine yourself to whether you're in the faith or not. And then he says you need to prove. If I prove myself... It means I've got enough evidence. To... And somebody said if you were taken to the court in the court of law and was being sued for a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Is there enough of God in you when you get put to the test? Is there enough to prove it? This is what Paul meant when he said in the book of Philippians, work out your own salvation with fear and truth. It's the same thing Peter would tell his congregation in 2 Peter 1.10, make your calling and election sure, brethren. You need to make sure that you know, that you know, that you know you've been saved. And what is the direct result according to verse 12 here? What is the direct result of having an evil heart of unbelief? What does the rest of that verse tell us is going to happen? You are going to depart from the living God. Did you see that? Let me read it again. Take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief. And how do we know you have an evil heart of unbelief? By departing from the living God. Now what in the world does that even mean? It means you're not going to last. It means you're going to fall by the wayside. This is what Jesus taught in Matthew 13. It means you're, you're not going to keep on keeping on. You're not going to keep on the fire and light. You are going to depart from the living God. Man's heart is the number one idol factory in all the world. We live in a society today that says, well, i got my Jesus preacher and you got your Jesus. No, there's one Jesus. There's one God that's manifest in three persons. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. All three are co-equal, co-eternal, co-existent. They're all three make up the one being of God. There's one God. You, ain't got your, you may have your version of God, but that don't mean it's the right version. See, we live in a society, everybody's got an opinion, but our opinions ain't always right. And they try to make that into their idea of God. If you'll read Romans chapter 1 sometime, you'll find out when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, but they made... Them images made like unto corruptible man, four-footed beasts and birds and creeping things. Hello? When we do not like the God of the Bible, we turn to other gods. Uh-oh. 
And I would say that in our culture today, our culture today, the individual person has made has done what Satan's goal was in the beginning. They've made their own self God. I was born a boy, but now I'm getting to choose. I can be a girl now. That's God's job, not yours. You wasn't born gay. You chose to be gay, so I'm going to be a homosexual. You're trying to become God. It's no different, man. You, you can fight. You can think you're fighting God, but you're playing into God's hand. And if it's God's will, you're going to do it. Ask Brother Jonah. He might make the whale swallow you up. But if God wants you to do something, He's going to get you. Or if you're going to be like these Jews and say, no, I don't believe it will. He's just going to kill you. There is a sin unto death, folks. And he says, you don't need to pray for it. It's that bad. You know what's missing in our day? There's no fear of God. Nobody fears this holy God anymore. We have this mentality because He's loving and gracious and long-suffering and patient, and He is those things. They think, boy, God's just going to let me slide. If Jesus wouldn't let His own Son slide, if He didn't spare His own Son, why do you think He's going to spare you if you don't believe? He's not. The whole point is these Jews would not believe and as a direct result, they didn't enter in. Are you believing? What is in your life now if through a circumstance or crisis that you're facing, you just don't believe God's able to handle? Is there any? Oh yeah, there's probably some and you're thinking, I don't know what I'm going to do. And at this point, we need to be like that father that had a son that was near death and he went to God. And he says, the Lord there in the, in the gospel records, and he says, my son's about dead. And he says, if you can believe, I'll help you. What the father say? Help thou my unbelief. He calls it an evil heart of unbelief and that the fact that you're going to depart This word depart means to fall away, to be drawn away, to withdraw from, to abandon, to refuse, to rebel, to reject. It ultimately means to become a castaway. This word depart is the Greek word that we get our English word apostate from. You know what apostate is? Somebody that's been confronted with the truth and would not receive the truth. They turned from the truth and never came back. Isn't that one of the signs of the last days, this great falling away? 1 Timothy 4, 1, The Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter days many shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. We're seeing that before our very eyes. A faith that fizzles before the finish was faulty from the first. You take this Bible from Genesis to Revelation... It says, they that endure to the end shall be saved. They that continue on will be saved. Do you understand what he's teaching? He that begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now some people think it's my hold of God that's got me saved. You're wrong. It's God's hold of you that's got you saved. And because He has saved you, you will finish your task. You will finish the race. You will come it. You will make it to the end. If you don't believe that, why are you even here? What's the point if I can get it and lose it? And according to Hebrews 6, if I can get it and lose it, I can't get it again because it's impossible to renew them again to repentance. That's what the book says. Oh, it can't mean that. Oh yeah, if you can lose it, you don't ever get it back. It's gone. I got numbers of verses from Genesis to Revelation. You are eternally secure and saved if you are saved. Amen. You're in His hand and no man can pluck you out of His hand. So we know, we know this ain't talking about people being saved and being lost. Again, no, if they're saved, this is a direct result of people that have deceived themselves. 
I would like to quote Andrew Murray right here at this point. He says, this is a terrible evil of unbelief. This unbelief, it incapacitates a man from having fellowship with God as the living God. The expression, the living God in our text occurs four times in this epistle of Hebrews. In the Old Testament, it's contrasted God with the dead idols who could not hear, speak, or help. Alas, oh how often professing Christians, instead of having a graven image, listen to what he says, the more dangerous idol of a thought image, a concept of your mind to which they bring their worship. Now you talk to people and you get to talk about who God is, and it's nothing more than a figment of their own imagination. That's the greater danger than going and worshiping a God made out of wood or stone out yonder. Because your own thought of who God is that contradicts what the book says God is, that's the greater danger. Because now you've convinced yourself God is like this and this is the only way God is, though Scripture says otherwise. Once you begin to deceive yourself, it's not looking good for you. Have you ever tried to unconvince somebody of something they believe it wasn't right? Have you tried to do that? It's hard, ain't it? And a lot of times you never do help them see the truth. Because they've convinced their own selves and because they refuse to believe what's found right here. This is all you've got to go on, friends. The Word of God. If the Word of God is not the Word of God, what hope do we have? We don't have any. <laughs> this, this departing away from this living God. When Jesus in, in, in John 6, He says, I'm the bread of life. And He says, if you'll eat my, bread, my body and drink my blood, you'll have part in Me. And they said, this is a hard saying. Who could know it, Master? And Jesus said, the words that I give unto you are spirit and life. And it says in verse 66 that many of His disciples walked no more with Jesus. And then Jesus looked at His other disciples, the twelve that are left, and He says, will you go away also? Do y'all know what Peter looked at? He says, where will we go, Lord? You and you alone have the words of eternal life. If you deny Jesus, if you resist and reject Jesus, who is going to save you? There is no other. You're not going to save yourself. I mean, all the doomsday prepping in the world is not going to stop Jesus from coming again. (laughs) But look in verse 13, and this is where I want to really... Hammer down for the less, and this is pretty far as we get. Look at verse 13. Verse 13 starts with but. So he contrasts what he just said in verse 12. But exhort one another daily. While it's called today, lest, here it is again, any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. So what is our remedy? Does it break your heart to see people leave the church? Does it break your heart to see somebody that once professed Jesus Christ go out in the world and deny Him before everybody said there's nothing to this deal? Does that break your heart? It ought to. We ought not be joyful when people leave the church. I don't care how much you don't like them. We're commanded to love them. Because I promise you, if you reverse reverse revolves rolls with them, that's probably stuff about you they didn't like either. Oh yeah. Yeah, you're mad with again. <laughs> oh yeah. Let me just have five minutes with your wife, sir. Let me have five minutes with your husband. I can find out just how much they don't really like about you, but they love you in spite of that. Uh Uh-oh. 
Well, when everybody just ain't like me, and everybody don't look like me and talk like me and think like me, bless God, you just need to get saved. Wrong. Wrong again. Oh, boy. Well, what do you mean? I mean, there is unity in diversity. You think of all the cultures that's really in the body of Christ. All tongues, nations, tribes, languages, all. Revelation said it said there's members of every, every ethnicity, every race in the family of God. We all come from different cultures. Oh, yes. Different styles, different preferences. And we're going to be with them in heaven. Why can't we get along with them now? Ah, uh, you're meddling again. Make you wonder. Us as Christians, we're commanded to love at all times. We're commanded to love our enemies. Last time I checked, that's still in the book. But you know what most Christians want to do with their enemies? Blow them off the face of the earth. Jesus told James and John, wait a minute boys, when y'all want to wipe them out, you need to watch yourself because you don't know what spirit you're in. Do you not know that God in His holiness, the very first time we thought an impure thought, He could have struck us dead like He did Ananias and Sapphira? How many of you lied in church? Uh-oh. Oh, I didn't intentionally mean to, but where was the lie? You exaggerated. Us, uh, us hunters and fishermen, the buck was this big, but you said it was this big. You just told a lie. God could have killed you. But he didn't. You fishermen say, boy, I had a horse. He was this big. Where's the picture of it? But he was really this big. You just told another lie. You, you get the idea. Anytime God could have done it, but he didn't. Thank God. He's a gracious God as well as a holy God. <laughs> but he says, exhort. Now, you know what this word exhort means? I, I like it. I like it. I looked it up. Woo! This word exhort is the same Greek word for the English word comforter in our New Testament. So this is the same word describing the Holy Ghost of God. So it's paraclete. Anybody know what the word paraclete means? It means to come alongside of. He comes to where you are to strengthen, to encourage, to walk with you, to help you, to encourage you, to comfort you, to help you. Now he turns to believers and he says, y'all need to exhort one another weekly, daily. This is why the early church went to church every day, not three times a week. Oh, you meddling again. See, this is why you need the church. The church doesn't exist for you. The, 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 you don't exist for the church. The church exists for you. These rogue people say, Jesus, yes, church, no. I don't put much stock in them. For two reasons. Number one, they don't love what Jesus loves. And number two, they don't obey what Jesus commands. Jesus commands not forsaken the assembling of yourselves together. You need to be here. You can't sit at home and Facebook Live and get the same results as you would be here and talk and shake hands and hug up on other believers. That preaching is part of it. Fellowshipping with other people is the other part of church. Amen. Yeah. Why do you think the government didn't mind us doing online service? They just didn't want us gathering because there's strength in numbers. And when the church gets together and gets help from one another and from the Word of God, it helps you press on. These people say they don't need the church. I question whether they're really born again. Because our church ain't this. The church is in me. I didn't have to pray for the Holy Ghost to come down. I brought it with me when I came. Amen. And this is why when the family gets together, God does something better for you than He does me sitting at home watching it on a screen. 
so on. And this is where the church is missing it. We come in, we find our place, we talk a few minutes, and then we can't wait for them to say amen so we can go, and there's no fellowship. I like it. I like fellowship. I like communicating. I like when people hang around and want to talk because we need that. We need that. And that's part of the encouragement. How can you encourage somebody when you're not where you're supposed to be? And how can I as your pastor exhort you, encourage you, charge you, help you with the Word of God when you don't show up when you know preaching is going on? So you can't go around saying, well, I'm not getting fed. Well, you don't show up at mealtime. I just don't like the menu. Well, it ain't but one menu to give, and that's the book. <laughs> so, I mean, this is where we are. This is another point that proves whether I'm saved. Do I love Jesus? Do I love the church? Do I love the people I go to church with? Chances are, if you have an evil heart of unbelief, you won't let people get to know you because you're scared they're going to judge you if they find out who you really are. You're the one that's got the problem because you came in with a facade on, hiding behind a mask. What you see is what you get. Sunday through Saturday. You see Daniel? He's the same on Monday as he is Sunday morning. <laughs> this is who I am. And I have Bible to say, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And the grace that was given to me wasn't in vain. Yeah! Praise God for that. That means, guess what? I can be who I really am because, number one, God already knows who I am. Yeah, that's right. And He not only knows who I am, He knows what I am. Yeah. Amen. So what? I want... Oh, preacher can't hear this. And I'm like, you ain't got to worry about me. He already heard it anyway. You meddling again. <laughs> You don't go right I am. This is serious business. This is where we live. This is what we're dealing with. We're called to comfort one another, exhort one another daily. He says, while it's called today. You know why we need it? Because I don't know what you're going through or what you've been through this week. I don't know. But one thing I can do, I can love you. I can show grace to you. And I can give you instruction from the Word of God. That, that's what I'm here for. There's a judgment-free zone here. I can't throw no rocks at you because I'm a sinner just like you. Amen. That's right. But we think, man, nobody can know about this. You know what James says in James chapter 5, verse 6? Confess your faults one to another that you may be healed. You know what I think one of the number one problems is, the reason why the church ain't too encouraging anymore? Because people are acting to be something they're not. Chances are because you're struggling with it, the person a few rows behind you is struggling with it. And because you come in and act like everything's okay, and you're play acting, you're a hypocrite if you do that. You're not being honest with God. You're not being honest with yourself. You're not being honest with the church. And the reason why you can't be encouraged and the reason why you can't encourage anybody else is because you won't open up and be who God made you to be. Oh boy. We walk in some deep water right now. How can you help somebody when you don't know them? How can you help somebody when you don't know how to help them? And I think a lot of times when we enter into the service, we already come in with defense mechanisms up. We come in with walls already built up. And we've already hardened our hearts before we ever got here. And, and we're scared to even hear everything the preacher's got to say because we may have to get right with God and we don't want everybody knowing 
We're not right with God. Can I tell you something? Ain't nobody in this room perfectly right with God. Not even me. That's why I need an advocate. That's why you need an advocate. Jesus Christ the right. There's no perfect saints, but there is a perfect Savior. And today, if you'll hear His voice, harden, not be hard. Last thing, the word harden means to be stubborn, bullheaded, hard-headed. It's almost like you're trying to ignore it. And the sad thing, people will sit here week after week ignoring the voice of God. And, and each time you ignore him, you're hardening your heart. But let me tell you about hardening your heart. There's going to come a day as God done with Pharaoh when God hardened Pharaoh's heart. But God may harden your heart and when that's done, it's over. He turns you over to a reprobate mind. So if he's calling, come on. Let's stand to our feet. Father, Sure love you. We thank you, Lord, for the day you've given us. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Pray it and find lodging place in our hearts and lives this morning. I pray, Lord, that you'd take your word, let it go forth. God, as the word of God, let it go forth as a hammer to break the hard hearts this morning. Let it go forth as that two-edged sword that's able to pierce the soul of man. God, let the Word of God be a help, a hope, salvation to the lost, and strength for the saved. And God, help us all just be who we are in You. Help us be open and transparent that we can minister to each other. And let everybody know, God, that nobody's perfect but You. God, have Your will and way in this invitation. And we'll thank You and praise You. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If she plays, would you come?